Our friends uh, in Crow Agency are just wonderful people and they're so helpful. They let us stay there uh, every time we go up there free because uh, it is vacant. But this afternoon, as most of you are painfully aware, I'm sure, I've been stuck in Acts 13 for some time. I see you smiling about that. Uh, but it's so full, and it's so full of good lessons for us that I haven't been able to get away. I just want to uh, review a little bit. We've seen, first of all, in this chapter, nine characteristics of God's model church. Now, those are very important. We want to build a church like that church, that Gentile church in Acts 13. The church God uses, I call it. And then we've seen the lessons on good news for failures in the reference to John Mark, who deserted the team um, after they left Cyprus, uh, after they left Paphos. Um, and after that, we saw some lessons on the Holy Spirit. You know, it says the Holy Spirit spoke. And that tells us so much that when we seek him, he will direct us that he's a person, that what he says is analogous to the word of God. There's so many lessons that we see in just that phrase, and the Holy Spirit said. So this, this chapter is full of lessons. And then we, last time we looked at, uh, not last time, time before that, I think. See, I get to preach here for you visitors, folks, every, you know, three or four months. So I just continue my series on Acts 13. But uh, then we looked at uh, something very interesting, and that is God's valuation of sorcery in Harry Potter. Anybody ever heard that name? God's evaluation of sorcery. This chapter has just got everything in it. The Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia. It means the use of drugs and enchantments and so forth. And so we see as very relevant in our day. Revelation chapter 18, verse 23 talks about pharmakia in the last days being used by Antichrist to deceive the nations. We don't know how he's going to do that, but it's very clear that these things will play a big role, and we see the stage being set in our day very clearly. So then last time, we looked at a number of things. First, we looked at eight points of apostleship because Paul begins to exercise his apostleship in relation to Elimas, the sorcerer. It's the first time that he's exercised his apostleship in this way. So we talked about apostles and uh, the signs of an apostle. And this is not for everyone what Paul does here in blinding Elimas. This is not some anything that we can do as believers today. This was part of the gifts of the apostles, the blinding of uh, uh, Elimas. It was a miraculous uh, pronouncement that Paul made with regard to the blinding of Elimas. Only an apostle could do it. In other words, we interpret this not prescriptively, but descriptively. It's something that is described for us so that we can learn lessons from, but it's not for us to do. And that's like so much of the book of Acts. It is descriptive, not prescriptive. And we have to understand that if we're not going to come out on the wrong end of our interpretation and use of the book of Acts. And so he talks about miracles, and we gave you six points on miracles because this was a miracle. The apostles had the authority and had the ability given from God to perform miracles. And so this is what happened there. Again, I said last time, and I say again, this is not something you want to do at home. Curse someone with blindness and cast out demons, you may end up like the sons, the seven sons of Sceva, we said in Acts 19. You remember that? The sons of a priest trying to cast out demons as they had seen the disciples do, and um, the demons said to the man, or the demon said to the man, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And the demon jumped out and mauled the seven sons of Sceva. Now, or Siva, however you pronounce his name. And when I told my wife that, she said, well, well, how did he jump out on them? So I had to tell her that whole story, which isn't biblical, but 
I always manage to give her a story to answer her questions. I always try to do that because she's very inquisitive. So then we looked at the conflict between Paul and Barnabas. And they had words. I mean, this was a contentious, the word, disagreement between Paul and Barnabas about the second missionary journey, whether or not to take John Mark. Barnabas, the son of consolation, of course, saw something in John Mark that he thought needed to be developed, that he would be a servant of God. But Mark failed, you remember, on the first missionary journey, and Paul would have nothing to do with him as far as going on the second missionary journey. And we talked about Mark's failure there and what happened there. Um, I just hardly can pass up these stories because God took a failure, John Mark, and made a man of God out of him and gave him a commission to write the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of a servant. He, he was a servant to Barnabas and Paul. He learned to be a servant later. And even Paul changed his mind about Mark, as you know, as you remember. So last time we were talking about this contention that took place. Um, it is a word that means, it's a word, and I, I never can say this word, proximos, proximos. Can you say it? Parox, paroxysm. It's a word for a really strong disagreement. And we talked about how leaders, Christian leaders, can fail, can sin. Of course, you're all aware of that because you know your pastors here. We fail, and we get up, and we go again. Um, but this afternoon, what I want to just highlight a few things here are some qualifications that a missionary needs to have to be considered a missionary and to become a missionary. Some qualifications as we read these 13 verses and the whole chapter and the next chapter. And in fact, if you're considering, if you ever thought, by the way, as my my desire and my hope that some of you might see God's hand in using you on a foreign field. And let me say, I'm not talking to young people necessarily. We usually talk to young people about going to the mission field, but let me tell you, if you're retired, God can use you, and there is so much need you wouldn't believe it. I'm too old to do the things that they needed at the, at the reservation. There were young kids and men out at the basketball course court by our church when it was 32 degrees, shooting hoops. Little kids shooting hoops, needing someone just to come along and shepherd them and visit with them and talk to them. I can hardly get out there, let alone shoot a hoop. But that's something that is needed up there, and God could use you. If, I think I was 69 when we went up there. I don't remember, but I, I was pretty old. Um, by the way, this little Band-Aid on my head, my wife's kind of touchy, you know. No, actually, <laughs> actually, I, I, I fell down in the front yard the other day. And, and I'm doing that, but I'm still... Uh, I'm still not uh, accepting, I'm still, what do you call it? Uh, denial. denial of, uh, you know, they want me to get one of those walker things, yeah. <laughs> or a cane, well, it may end up like that, but look at, let's look at some of the qualifications here in this chapter uh, that I think are, are important for us to know. Uh, qualifications that Barnabas and Saul had, uh, they're, in this chapter, guidelines for you, uh, if you're thinking about going in that direction. Uh, guidelines for what a missionary ought to be. And so let's look at verse 1 of chapter 13. Now, there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen or Menachem, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, that's Herod the Great's household, and Saul. 
So there are five men that are listed here, and these five men, uh, at least in the Greek text, are divided into two groups. The first three are prophets, and the second two are teachers. Now, this is clearly seen in the Greek, which I don't read, but I've understood that this is the setup in these verses. So you know who the prophets are and who the teachers are. Prophets were men in the New Testament church who gave God's revelation to the church before the New Testament was in writing. They proclaimed the word of God. Teachers were the ones who came along and made clear the teaching that was given. And so these were the prophets and teachers. They were in this church in Antioch, a Gentile church, and they were exercising their spiritual gifts, and they had the proper gifts for leading a church, the proper gifts of prophecy and teaching in particular. And so here is the first thing that I see in this chapter with regard to qualifications for being a missionary. That is that you have the proper spiritual gift to do it. Now, that's anybody's guess as to exactly what that would be, but I would say it would be evangelism and teaching. Those would be primary gifts for missionaries, but there are others. For instance, if your wife goes with you, she doesn't necessarily have to have the gift of teaching or evangelism. It'd be good, and probably that's the way it goes. I think of Tom and um, Sharon Jacobs. They are both um, very evangelistic, and that's a wonderful thing. But the first thing you have to think about is what is my gift? And to do that, you've got to know what your gift is. And some of you probably don't know what your gift is at this time. But let me tell you, your gift operates whether you know it or not, when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're filled with the Spirit. So that's what you want to do. That's what you want to be. Filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, your gift operates. But if you know your gift, then that gift can be developed, and it can become stronger and more useful. And so the first thing here, if you're thinking about being a missionary, is do you have the gifts that would facilitate you in that ministry, that would help you in that work? Um, so we talked about nine characteristics of this church, the church that God uses. And one of the strongest, I think, is the fact that there were two teachers. And there was teaching constantly in this church. And the importance of teaching cannot be overlooked. This is the kind of church that people need to be in. It's the kind of church that taught its people. It was going over time. They were well taught in the Word of God. They knew the Word of God. Uh, and that was demonstrated in their love. You remember, here's a Gentile church, 300 miles north of Jerusalem. But the church in Jerusalem was suffering hardships and privation, persecution. So what did this young church do in Antioch? They began to attempt to lift the burdens of their Jewish brethren in Jerusalem. They sent gifts by the hands of Paul and Barnabas to help them at that time. So here's an important thing. When we see the church, it should be a church that is a teaching church. This church, according to this chapter, uh, Paul operated in the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's what a good church is. It has people who understand what the control of the Holy Spirit is in their life and what it will do and how it will change things. And so they operate. The, the people in this church, for the most part, understand and operate. Filling of the Holy Spirit simply means they allowed him to control their lives and their giving and their love for the lost. That's what they had because they began the first foreign missionary quest here. So I, I want to say uh, this is the kind of church that is the only thing, and, and listen to me clearly, that can save our world gone mad. A church that teaches its people right from wrong. Politics will never win the day. Politics may change a little for a time, but it's the teaching of the Word of God that will renew men and women's hearts and lives, change them forever, and that's what we need. If you want to do something to change the world, share your faith with another individual. See them come to faith and see the change that's made. In fact, did you know the gospel, the old English word gospel, was good spell? 
Because when someone heard the gospel and they responded positively to it, a good spell took over. They began to be different people. It was like a good spell had been put on them. And that's what the gospel does. And that's a wonderful thing. So here's a church that was a teaching church. Now, there's a lot of things going on in our school today, and I don't know if you're as upset about them as, as I may be, but uh, when I hear things and read things online, like a school in Pennsylvania who instructs its teachers to hide the preference of their children with regards to names that they take, and pronouns that are used of them. When teachers in a school take trans identifying students and do not let the parents know what is going on, they're told not to. In another instance, a coach was fired because he called a male student trans identifying with a masculine pronoun. So he was fired. This is what's going on in our schools is unbelievable to an old codger like me, I'll tell you. But these things are going on. Our world has gone mad. Here's another article that I read in the Washington Stand. I don't know if you know of that or have ever heard of it. I never had. Sounds like it must be believing people. But it suggests in an issue that uh, center stage in the midterm elections will see a vote to change our world. That will see a vote that may change our world. No, the gospel will change our world. Politics will never change our world. And we need to set all of our energy in the word of God and in people and in the gospel if we want to see this world change. My daughter, Joanna, called us the other night from California, said there is something going around now in, in their little, littlest daughter's school. She's 11. It is a movement for the LGBTQ. And the children are going around asking each other if they support it. And of course, our little granddaughter doesn't support it. Her mother has taught her better. So she's being bullied every day by this. So she called, wanted to know what I would say uh, if I were bullied like that. And I said, well, honey, you just need to say, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. So I don't agree with that. And you say that and you may suffer persecution, you know. And Jesus says, rejoice for so persecuted they the prophets. Be in line with Jesus. Be in line with his disciples. Be in line with the prophets. And so that's what she's going to do. And interestingly enough, the next day, no one asked her. But this is something that's going around. Well, how many, how many qualifications? We've only got one qualification. Set. So the, that's the first qualification. Proper spiritual gifts, um, missionary service requires proper spiritual gifts. Now, verse 2, moving right along. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So here's what they're doing. You might circle that word ministering. Here, is Paul, here are Paul and Barnabas. They are actively involved in their local church. You want to know where God is leading you? You want to know if God would have you go to a foreign field? By the way, there are 540 Native American tribes in this country. The last I heard, 200 of them had no witness for the Lord Jesus. They are on your doorstep. They are in your own nation. And the Indians and our friends that are so dear have a hard time with a white man's message. 
So it's not like some places of our world that you can go and have a hundred converts in a week. It's not like that. It doesn't happen. In fact, when we first went to Montana, our pastor told us that shortly before we came, there was a sign on the barbershop in town, no dogs and no Indians. That's Montana. And Montana still has places like that. And it's difficult for them. I, I'm a way off here. When we first went up there, I met with some Indian pastors on the reservation round table discussion. There were about ten, eight or ten of us. And I've told many of you know this story. But we were there, I was there for the first time, and big burly Indian sitting across the table from me. And um, they asked me why I came. And I said, well, I feel like my people have wronged you. You know, in many, many ways. So, you know, I, I had to think on my feet, I had to think fast, and I didn't know whether I was saying the right thing or not, but this big Indian sitting across the table from me. I didn't know it was going to be that loud. He hit the table, and I thought, oh, man, what I say? And with tears, he said, well, we did the same to you. And I think you need to forgive us. And that guy and I became like this. Now when I see him, he picks me up off the ground. <laughs> and he's a tall, big guy. Lane Simpson. He's a, a wonderful guy. But a lot of hard feelings in the Indian country. You know, the Europeans, when they came, our ancestors committed genocide with American Indians. There were millions when they began to come here. And in the early 1900s, there were thousands. So where am I going? I'm way off. But the second thing, if you want to know if God is calling you to be a missionary, get involved in your local church where there are mature people, mature Christians, mature leaders, and God uses those to direct you in the way that he wants you to go. You know, he has this system in everything. Um, in school, it's your teacher that you listen to, and he's the one who has authority. In the... Uh, Family, it's your parents that you listen to that God uses to direct you. In your church, it's your church leaders who God uses in that case to protect you. All of these things are important. So this qualification is listen to those. Hebrews chapter 13, who have the rule over you, it says, obey them. Well, pastors love that, don't they? But it means because they pray for you. Hebrews 13, 7 and, 13, and 17, you might want to look at those verses. So that's where it is. Um, your, your calling will involve your being part of the lo local church and working in the local church. So are you engaged? Are you active? Are you involved in the ministry um, and listening? Look at verses uh, 3 and 4. Verse 3. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid, hand, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So here they are. They are now being set apart. They are going to be, here we see a third qualification that is, that they were listening to their leaders. Paul and Barnabas were already informed by God that he was calling them to be missionaries, that they were to be missionaries. But they waited for the church and the church's leaders to affirm that and to be part of the apparatus that would 
point them out and send them out and identify with them and be their support base. So this is what they did. Again, uh, in the family there is a, an apparatus, the parents to submit to and learn from. In marriage it's the husband. Now, this is a bad thing, isn't it? That you are supposed to listen to your husband. But this is God's command, and this is this is not on the subject, y'all. I get way off sometimes. This is a rabbit trail. If you wives really intend upon knowing God's will for you, listen to your husband. And that doesn't matter whether he's a believer or not. You've been told to submit to your own husband as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can do that, my wife was sharing with a lady one time, and this lady was one of our well-to-do uh, members of this community, and she was just so worried about a decision they were about to make to sell a house. And my wife just shared it with her, you know, that's not your problem. Her husband had made the decision. That's not your problem. If you will let your husband do these things, he'll learn the lesson or you'll go where God wants you to go. And um, that's, you know, you're cheating really because you have a hedge on us husbands because we have to go directly to the Lord. And, and when you ask your husband questions, and I would encourage you to do that, wives, ask him like you don't know anything about the Bible. If you want to get your husband into the Bible, just ask him all kind of Bible questions. And if he's a believer, he knows he's responsible to help you and to nurture you, according to Ephesians. That will get him in. My wife's way ahead of me. She was saved when she was seven. I was saved when I was 19. So she's a way ahead of me spiritually. So I never do anything without asking her. But the interesting thing is she never does anything without asking me. She is so submissive that... It, it scares me because I have to just, you know, does your wife thank you for carrying out the garbage? My wife has never failed. Well, that's my responsibility, I thought. But she's just grateful for that and she expresses that and makes me feel good. That's great. So here are Barnabas and Paul. They're, they're exercising their spiritual gifts. They're involved in the local church. They're listening to their leaders. There were five men that were leading this church and they were listening. Here's a fourth one that really comes just by observing this chapter and reading it. These men were mature. One of the qualifications for being a missionary is that you're a mature believer, that you're grown up. Many missionaries fall on the mission field. Many missionaries die on the mission field even at times by their own hand. You need to be mature if you're going to be a missionary. This is one of the qualities. Paul and Barnabas were mature believers. Barnabas, of course, is the one who sought out Paul after he became a believer and led him by the hand because all the other Christians were afraid of him. And he introduced him to the assembly. And then he went 14 years in the desert studying the word of God meditating on the word of God. These men were mature. And if you don't believe that, just read the rest of chapter 13 and Paul's sermon. It is remarkable. Of course, he had been a Pharisee possibly before he became a believer and he knew the Old Testament by heart. But now everything gelled. Everything came together. So this is something that's important. These men were mature believers. Here's another thing. A fifth qualification is that they should be students of the word. It seems like I just said that. Maturity and student go hand in hand. Um, Paul's sermon clearly shows that. Here's a sixth qualification. And that is someone who is a witness. If you're not witnessing at home, why would you want to go to a foreign land and not witness there? 
You need to be involved in witnessing to your neighbors, sharing the gospel with friends, telling people about him. So that's a sixth qualification. Notice we're going really fast. Barnabas, see, I can do that. Barnabas, I can go fast. Barnabas and Saul were witnesses. And, of course, we see that in this chapter. Then the ninth, actually the sixth through the eleventh verse going to Elamas, the Jewish uh, false prophet, uh, the sorcerer. Uh, the qualification there is that Paul, you remember, being filled with the Holy Spirit, that was his modus operandi. That was the way he lived his life, particularly in tense situation like this. When you remember, oh yeah, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that God can control me. I don't know about you, but I pray before every conversation. Anytime someone says, hey, I got something to ask you. Man, in my mind, I'm on my knees immediately because I know I don't have the answer, but God has the answer, and he can give the answers. So we need to do that when we approach someone. And by the way, I'm retired, and I'm old, and I'm, I'm not social, and I don't you know, get out, but I meet people every day and the Lord says, you need to share with them. You need to do that. So, Lord, what, what do you want me to say? How do you want, you know, the other day it was interesting. I was at uh, Supercuts and I came out after my haircut and sat on the bench out front and there was a guy sitting there. And uh, so the Lord did what he always does said, well, are you going to talk to him? That's what he's, well, are you going to talk to him? Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I said, um, what are you counting on to get you to heaven? He said, wow, that's a deep question. Well, this guy just happened to be the son of a well-known scientist who you would know if I could remember his name. <laughs> and his brother was one of the great Great baseball players with the Chicago Bears that you would know his name if I could remember it. I mean, in the Hall of Fames and all of that. And here I was, the Lord gave me an opportunity to share his gospel with someone who was somebody. And uh, you wanted, then we got to talking about Custer, of course. And <clears throat> but, you know, it's not easy to share your faith, but it's something that we are called to do and God always blesses when we do it so here is a seventh qualification be filled be controlled with the Holy Spirit and just in closing I know you're glad to hear that I would just like to say particularly to young people but more so to people older because some of you have time to spare and some of you older folks could do things that you would not believe and see fruit and see God work in such a way that you just could not believe it. People who are retired, I retired, what was that, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. In fact, I've retired three times now. <laughs> and I tell people, you know, you can't retire from being a Christian, but you maybe should retire from being a pastor, especially when you start repeating yourself. You can't remember anything, and especially when people say, it's about time for you to retire. <laughs> you ought to do it before that time. You ought to retire. It doesn't mean you retire from being a Christian, but you can retire from being a, a leader, a public leader in the church. Um, God still has a lot of knowledge left in some of us. And he wants it all. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you for your word, for the precious word of God that is our meat, that feeds us and matures us and grows us. Father, we pray that through even this time today, you will speak to individuals that you have put a calling on their lives 
give them understanding of what you want, of guidance to the place you want them to be in. And bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.